Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on your time zone. And welcome to Counting Stars, an international online youth and experts event on the contributions of fusion power to global climate action. I'm Jonah Cordonia Gary, youth advisor at Energy for the Common Good, former ITER intern, a scholar at Winchester College in the UK, and vice chair of the Global Youth Council on Science, Law, and Sustainability. Fusion power is fundamentally the power source of the universe. Every star, including the sun, produces its light and heat due to fusion reactions. Tiny hydrogen nuclei combine with each other in a plasma at incredible temperatures and pressures, forming helium involving no fossil fuels and nearly no waste. The mission of the fusion movement is to take this power source and make it a reality on Earth providing clean, efficient energy for all our needs. Really, all that we're doing is catching up with the rest of the universe. Fusion power has exciting potential to advance the so global sustainable development goals, especially SDG 7, for everyone to, to be able to access affordable, reliable, sustainable, modern, and safe energy sources, and SDG 13, for all countries to accelerate implementation of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and its Paris Agreement by reducing GHG emissions and supporting alternative renewable power worldwide. As you know, the purpose of our online workshop today is to raise awareness about the potential of fusion power and other renewables as a solution to climate change, and especially to help youth learn more about the exciting new developments, including some incredibly interesting recent news, and become advocates for fusion power and global climate action, stars that can be counted on, and also explore our own futures in this field as a fusion generation. The workshop will begin with opening remarks from my co-chair, Jane Hotchkiss. After this, we are honored to be joined by Laban Koblenz of ITER and Sir Stephen Cowley of Princeton, who generously agreed to join us as keynote speakers on new developments in fusion engagement in science. I will introduce them properly in a minute. After our keynotes, we will enjoy a panel discussion with renowned experts in fusion science and education. Dr. Pablo Rodriguez Fernandez of MIT, Kayla Miller of ECG, and Dr. Arturo Dominguez of Princeton University. This will be followed with, by a Q&A with the keynote speakers, as well as our three specialists. If all the speakers can respect their agreed timings of 12 to 15 minutes for keynotes and four to six minutes for the panel, we hope to have a very good long period for an engaging Q&A between the youth and others who have registered online, our speakers and our panelists. To begin, I'm very grateful to welcome my co-chair, Jane Hotchkiss, the president of ECG, who has spent 30 years on pro-renewable advocacy policy and regulatory work. With ECG, she now dedicates her expertise to building a roadmap for fusion as a regulated, accepted, and welcomed green commercial choice. She's kindly agreed to give our opening remarks. It is my honor to give the floor to Jane. Um, my name is Jane Hotchkiss, and I'm the president of ECG. We're a nonprofit. We're based in the United States, but we focus on fusion both in the U.S. Uh, very specifically, and then as it relates to the global rise in fusion energy, and as Jonah noted, the importance of its equitable distribution once it becomes a commercial power source. Um, as, he, as Jonah also noted, I came to, to fusion after a long career in renewable energy, uh, which I started when I was probably just a little bit, well, I may have been the same ages as some of you, uh, looking for what my mark on the world would be. And as you'll see, I don't have the word doctor before my, my name. I'm a generalist. I have a history degree. I've also been a journalist and I have uh, participated as a legal intern thinking about a career in law, but deviated because I got to work on renewable energy projects quickly. And once I, once I found energy and that intersection of all the interest areas that I could imagine, uh, my uh, my goose was cooked, so to speak, educationally, um, and I've spent the la the rest of the time bringing renewable energy forward in the United States. I started in California and moved 
uh, renewables as a as an understood and then uh, promoted source of energy across the country um, that resulted in being part of the renewable portfolio standards and the creation of other incentive programs to make to create a market for wind, solar, and other renewable technologies. Uh, most of you probably take them somewhat for granted, uh, but in my lifetime, they went from being something that a few people did in California to, and I was laughed at for in New England, to a viable growing concern. And I am so often jealous of the world outside of the United States where offshore wind and other forms of renewables have had a, a much longer uh, lifetime of application. We all have to catch up because in climate, we have a short, a short window left and a lot of work to do. Um, I came to Fusion when it became obvious to me that we weren't going to make our numbers in renewables alone and that the fear of intermittency was paralyzing all of the regulatory and other concerns, uh, whether it be utility for the electric grids or the industrial uh, community for their need for steady state, high energy power. Uh, we weren't gonna penetrate those markets fast enough to make a difference on climate change. And with that, um, I entered the, the hallowed halls of MIT, which happens to be close to me, uh, not as a student, but perhaps as a gadfly slash annoying um, presence in a room, reminding everybody there that their real job was to commercialize fusion for climate change. And today we have over 30 companies in the US and far more globally um, that are all working on different forms of fusion devices, all intent on capturing, as Jonah said, that star in a bottle or that sun in a bottle or as we've seen at the National Ignition facility, uh, facility, a different approach at creating that same, at harnessing that same intensity of future energy. Um, I, can't, I can't point out how, how much this is needed um, for climate change, but I also really want to focus uh, my time here with you on the importance of it being an equitable, accessible, uh, understood energy source for all, which is one of the reasons informing ECG that our educational efforts focus first in communities where the access to uh, science, uh, technology, math, uh, and engineering, and, and any of the economics, all of the science and uh, the science and, and math based learning has been limited or at least uh, less popular. Um, and that's where Kayla has come in as our director of education, initiating that. She'll tell you more later. Um, so we focus on education. We also fo focus on uh, educating the validators, those who will come forth at regulatory uh, levels, at administration, uh, whether it be the, the president's circle or whether it be a critical state circle or in some cases within the way our utilities are regulated, a uh, regional circle. Um, but we are trying to capture as many of the interests of the pre-market as we can to give Fusion the opportunity once it's, once it's past scientific net into energy net and we're building power devices that the customers and the, those around those customers are all eagerly awaiting the, the plug-in or the direct heat or the use of that power. Um, and I will close by saying the other really critical thing to leave behind is the fact that Fusion is a partner to the green energies of today. It is not the only energy source. It is not a competing energy source. And one of the very earliest things I think Fusion has done is to enable a lot of other technologies to move into markets, whether it be the high temperature superconducting ma magnetic tape that has revolutionized tokamaks um, or the supercomputing that uh, Sir Cowley is so uh, closely uh, allied to or use, uh, utilizing, or whether it be the breakthroughs that we've seen coming out of the 
the National Ignition Facility in diodes for medical devices. These are all exciting things that have caused both advances in fusion, but have also caused better power management, better, uh, better surgical and other medical advances, and are being used throughout the world right now. So this isn't just one, it will not be just one approach. Uh, it will not be just one sector. It really is a ubiquitous opportunity to put a clean energy source and a clean energy sector to work. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jonah to uh, take us into the keynotes, two people who will certainly speak far more eloquently than I ever could. Thank you, Jane. Um, your remarks are, as always, both deeply insightful and also an inspiring challenge. Um, for the keynotes, um, our keynote speaker on international fusion engagement is Levin Kloplitz. He serves as the head of communications at ITER, at the world's largest multinational science and technology project, a collaboration of 53 countries. 35 countries to demonstrate industrial scale fusion energy. He also has incredibly rich and varied life experience, including controlling the innards of a nuclear submarine, streamlining a bureaucratic policy, unlocking the potential of a research university as associate vice president and chief of staff, and promoting a cyber privacy business concept. In the US Congress, he led Senator Joe Lieberman's efforts to create the Eve Government Act of 2002 for public sector innovation before his leadership position at ITER. A keynote speaker on international fusion science and technology is Professor Sir Stephen Cowley, a theoretical physicist and expert on nuclear fusion and plasma. He directs the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, where he is also a highly distinguished professor of physics. He served previously as the president of Corpus Christi College in Oxford and chief of exec a chief executive officer of the UK Atomic Energy Authority, UKAEA, also the head of the Cullum Center for Fusion Energy. He's a fellow of the Royal Society and of the Royal Academy of Engineering and was knighted by Queen Elizabeth in June 2018 for his contributions to fusion science. We're asking Laban to speak first. Laban, the floor is yours. So uh, thank you, Jonah and um, and Jane, as the co-hosts here, and thank you to all of you who are who are online. I will um, begin sharing my screen and launch into uh, Jonah. Just give me a heads up that yes, you can see what I'm doing here. Is that correct? Everything seems to be working. Okay, good. So um, I will. First of all, I, I'm thrilled to be talking to young people today. Um, we are, I think, Jonah, slightly ahead of schedule, but I'm going to stick to the to the 12 to 15 minutes um, aspect because uh, there may be questions uh, that 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 will give more time for. Um, what you're seeing on the screen here, and what I'm going to talk about, is largely the international collaboration for the uh, for the ITER project, um, and it's. 35 countries working together. So I'm gonna be talking about a little bit of nuclear physics to explain how we fit into um, nuclear versus not nuclear. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the international aspect and why I happen to think it's really essential that not only we, we fix the technology, but we, we keep trying to force uh, the model in which countries who don't always agree with each other can really work together, why that's a benefit and will be a significant contributor to how effective we are with uh, with climate change. So on the photo you see here, I'm, I'm sitting in this office over to the left, this sort of elbow shaped building. And this is the Eacher work site, about a kilometer long and, and uh, 400 meters wide. What you're, what you're seeing in the center, if you can see my cursor or the big building at the center, that's where the action will happen, where we're trying to build what's called a tokamak, a fusion, uh, a hydrogen fusion device. Everything around it is either a factory like the red striped building at the back or a support system that somehow is geared toward making this whole thing work. Um, I'll go into more of what all that is, but that's just sort of what, this is the view when I look out my window every day. And we're stuck here in the South of France in this beautiful, peaceful environment of, uh, of Provence. So why we're here, et cetera, more of that to, uh, to come in the presentation. 
But I want to focus for a second on the international aspect. I would challenge you to find any project in the world where all of these flags are flying together. Like you might say, okay, we just are finishing up the FIFA World Cup. And so that would be an example. And, and cer certainly you could find it at the United Nations and other places. But what's different here, where you see Russia's flag flying next to the US flag or China's flag flying next to the European flag, normally we'll see those, those things in the news, those nations in the news fighting about something, e either uh, maybe even a, a physical war, unfortunately, but also trade wars and a lot of different ideologies and so forth. So what we're trying to do here, when I talk about a generational challenge, we're trying to deliver to your generation something that is better than we inherited, a cleaner planet. And fusion is one of the ways we think that we can do that. So Joan has already covered eloquently, you know, fusion is the source of, of light and heat and, and so forth on earth. But it's it's useful to understand that at the heart of the sun or the stars, that happens with gravitational confinement. The sun is about 300,000 times larger than the earth. So we think of it as a ball of hydrogen, and it is, but at the center of the sun, hydrogen is being smushed, really, um, just squashed together by sheer gravitational force. And the, the density of the hydrogen there, while it's a gas, it's got a density about 70 times the density of steel. So the particles are simply forced together to create fusion. So how do we do that on Earth? How do we harness this idea of the, you know, E equals MC squared and convert a tiny amount of matter to a large amount of, um, of energy? What you heard that Jane referred to and, and, and Jonah referred to obliquely as well um, is another kind of fusion than what we are doing here at the ITER project. What you heard in the news this week was inertial confinement, and we can take more in the Q&A about how that differs. But what they're essentially doing is taking a very, very tiny pellet and concentrating a huge amount of energy from every direction using lasers. What ITER does and what magnetic confinement does using either a machine like you see in the graphic in front of you or sometimes in a, in a twisted version of this, which is not as smooth a circle, more of a, a stellarator example where the where the magnets are are twisted what we're doing here is taking a large circular chamber and putting just two to three grams of hydrogen two forms of hydrogen that you see here represented by the orange ball with one uh gray ball which is a neutron so that would be a form of hydrogen called deuterium or tritium and you put those two in in uh in in defined uh, portions, just two to three grams together. You heat them up. First, you run a current through them. So you separate the nuclei from the uh, from the electrons. And the importance there is that everything becomes, when you make it ionized, everything is charged. Why is that important? Because we're going to heat this little bit of gas, now a plasma. We're going to heat it to 150 million degrees, 10 times the temperature at the core of the sun. And that means that no material on Earth can possibly withstand that, that temperature. So how do you do that? You, you create an invisible magnetic cage that is conformed more or less precisely to the metal cage you see. And that magnetic cage is holding that plasma, that very hot plasma, away from the walls and heating it along a, a, the, the electrical lines, the spiral of electrical lines that goes through this plasma. By, de, by definition, because all of these particles are ionized, you hold them away from the walls. So that's a very good thing because it's not going to crash into the walls. But then in addition, you've got um, a product coming out of this reaction, two products. One is a helium nucleus, um, which is got about five times the energy of the original particles, and a neutron, which has got about 20 times the energy. The reason that this is all set up in this particular way is that the only particle here that is not magnetic, not confined by the magnetic field, is this neutron. This neutron is insanely energetic. It's so, it's so energetic that if you released it in free space, it would reach the moon in about eight or nine seconds. So that's cool because the neutron will crash into the walls. And just like if you shot a bullet into a steel plate, 
and you then felt the steel plate, you would say, wow, that's hot because the kinetic energy of the bullet would hit a steel plate and transfer into heat energy. That is essentially what the neutron does in this illustration. It hits the wall. Many neutrons hit the wall and they transfer their energy to um, the metal wall. And there's water running behind those walls, which in a commercial plant, either water or some other form of, of fluid would be there to capture the energy, transfer it into, uh, for example, heating the water to make steam, to make electricity. So that's the, that's the essence of the concept here. Now, the other particle here, this helium nucleus, has a lot of energy remaining, so it can continue to heat the rest of the plasma, transfer its energy as heat. Initially, you're going to have external heating systems that would be, if you were making a wood fire, it would be similar to uh, adding a match to add an external heat to try to, you know, to try to make the wood begin to burn. If you can get to a point where most of the heating is coming from the helium nucleus here, the, all of these helium nuclei energizing the plasma, then you get to something called a burning plasma. If you get to a point where you can turn all the heating systems off and it will still keep working just by adding in more fuel as you would with a, with a normal fire when you make a wood fire, that becomes what we call ignition. You turn all the heating systems off. ITER is designed to achieve at least a burning plasma. Maybe if we're very lucky, we'll be able to adjust to hit ignition. But why is that important? It's because until about 10 days ago, we'd never created on Earth a controlled burning plasma. The experiment that you heard about created not only a burning plasma, but, but also ignition. But I won't go into a lot of detail there. That's, that's done in the inertial confinement. So that's what you learn. Now you can all build a tokamak. But I, wanted, I want to point out one other thing. How does this differ from, uh, from fission? Yeah, because a lot of you will hear of the power plants that are out there, they're on Earth now creating, creating fission. And it's important to point it out for the contrast. Why? In a fission power plant of equivalent size, you would have roughly um, two to 300 tons of something very heavy like uranium. You would split that uranium with a, with a neutron and in that splitting create other products and then more neutrons, which creates a chain reaction. So now you've got the three contrasts that make um, fission stand out as being very different from fusion. Why? First of all, it's two to 300 tons of something instead of two to three grams of something. And that shows you automatically that you've got a lot less material to deal with. If something goes wrong, um, the volumes, the sheer volumes say that it is safer. In addition, you don't have this cascading burden of additional uh, products when the nucleus is, the uranium nucleus is split. So with fission, you have a, a waste issue that largely is, is either, I would not say it disappears entirely, but is much, much a, a tiny fraction in fusion of the waste that you would have from fission. So safer, um, more, uh, 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 le less waste. And then in terms of the chain reaction, you don't have to moderate that. You don't, you, fusion is very hard to do, but you don't have that cascade of additional neutrons creating more fission, et cetera. So again, uh, much, much safer. In addition, the fuel here, this deuterium fuel is abundant in water. So you're really getting fuel, you're getting energy out of water. The tritium fuel is very scarce. It doesn't occur naturally on earth. So we have lithium in the walls, in the metal walls here, that will breed the, uh, the tritium that you will get for, uh, for fusion. So abundant fuel, very safe, very environmentally friendly, um, minimal waste. Those are the advantages of fusion. So why aren't we doing it? Because it's just hard to do. ITER is designed, in addition to this entire aspect of the, of the um, of the fusion uh, uh, technology, it is designed to bring all of these countries together to try to make um, fusion at industrial scale. 
1985, this idea was cooked up between Reagan and Gorbachev uh, at when they were trying to reduce the overall inventory of, of, of weapons. And since that time, you've had Europe and Japan and then China and India and Korea join. And in, in uh, 2010 to 2022, this is sort of uh, how, how far we have gotten. So the countries involved are not contributing component uh, cash. They are contributing a small amount, but most of it comes as components. So every country involved is putting together some element of this fusion device. So the central magnet here is contributed by the US. But if you look at it in more detail, Japan is contributing the superconductor that the US makes into this central magnet. Um, Europe, Japan, and Korea, sorry, Japan and, and Italy are contributing these gold-shaped magnets. And then Russia and Europe and, and uh, uh, China are contributing these round magnets that you see here. So I'll, I'll go through now very rapidly a bit of, of how all of these parts are fitting together, being made around the world and, and shipped here to, uh, to ITER, to this work site here, where we're about 80% or so of the civil works are done and we're in the process of assembly. So for the past two years, we've been putting all of these pieces together. This big component, 30 meters in diameter, is part of the overall uh, case, the overall thermos, we call a cryostat that fits together. So when you look at this being taken by the overhead cranes put here in this circle, um, I'll give you a top-down view to illustrate. So you see all of these lines in the top-down view. These are the welding lines where Indian supervisors supervised German welders under French nuclear regulation on an international site to put this whole thing together. And they took this 30 meter component, which is just a, a, a specifically conformed piece of steel with under three millimeters of tolerance. So size and precision. Um, you'll see much more of this in the, in the photos that follow. So this is the magnet that came from China. This is the magnet that was made here on site because it's 17 meters in diameter, too big to actually ship. Here you have a vacuum vessel sector made in Korea and a, a D-shaped toroidal field coil that has to fit directly onto this. So this, this coil, this magnet, weighs about the same as a 747 uh, jetliner to give you perspective. And then in between the magnet and this vacuum vessel sector goes this very thin piece of silver coated metal right? Amazing engineering. But recently, what we found is that we've got some flaws in this, in this particular piece of metal. Some of the cooling piping that runs in between has corrosion. So now we're going to be doing backup. Is that a problem? Sure. But it's how everybody is also learning from how ITER works. So you take this whole sector, which is one-ninth of the circle, 40 degrees out of 360, and you dump it here into the into the tokamak. The idea was that we were going to put eight more of these around, but now that we've discovered a problem, we'll take it back out. We will do some additional uh, work on it. And um, again, learn from our mistakes, transmit those, those uh, findings to all the other people who are working on, on fusion around the world. So this is where it was sitting. Uh, it is sitting at the moment. And now uh, because of the corrosion that we have here and some non-conformities, We'll take that out, start again, and put it back in and continue to assemble the machine. A few more pictures before I conclude. Here are the factories where we were assembling these magnets that were too big to ship. This is the, uh, the, the, fa the uh, factory here at ITER where you would be all invited to come see it. Here's our control building just recently put together. This is where one of our third heating systems come together. Here is uh, where we are making another of the heating systems, assembling uh, material from, from Japan and from Europe. Here is the cryogenics facility where we cool the magnets, where we will be able to cool the magnets down using these, uh, 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 the, these tanks of liquid nitrogen and liquid helium. These are the cryo lines that go through the, the um, uh, facility to transmit the cryogenics. 
Here are the electrical switch yard, in a, one switch yard for steady state operations, largely made in the US, another switch yard made largely by China, where we shoot in the power through uh, the magnet conversion building here, where you will see these yellow magnets, some of which are yellow, um, sorry, uh, bus bars, which are just giant extension cords, many of them shipped overland from Russia, uh, including during since the conflict shipped across Europe, where the, Europe has sanctions on Russia, but has exempted the ITER project. And you see, you will see components from uh, China, India, Korea, and Russia here in the building. The cooling water system at ITER, largely made from India and Europe. The um, some some additional smaller magnets made in China manufacturing going on around the world. This is the top of that overall cryostat thermos. Uh, more magnets being made in Korea, vacuum vessels, sorry, Japan, vacuum vessel sectors being made in China. Um, another vacuum, sorry, that was in Europe. These, these made in Korea. And here, uh, the, the pieces of the central solenoid, the big magnet that goes at the middle, and the, um, the, the round magnet that goes on the top made in Russia, which just left the shipyard uh, last month, uh, uh, sorry, about five weeks ago, left the shipyard to sail down the river and is being put on a ship to, uh, to come to Eater. So that concludes my presentation. Just to say what, as a last item, that you see all of these visitors, you are more than welcome if you make it to Eater to ask for a visit and we'll be delighted to uh, to give you a tour and explain more. And I'll take questions, but uh, I think after uh, we hear from Sir Stephen. Thank you, Laban. Your presentation as always is incredibly inspiring, um, particularly for me, the points on international cooperation from a climate change perspective are completely mind blowing. Um, for questions, um, we'll have them right after the panel. Um, we have a time slot reserved for them. Now, um, I invite Sir Stephen to give his presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's uh, it's about midday here in, in the United States, and uh, it's, it's wonderful to talk to you because these are great times for fusion. Um, we're moving forward from a science program closer and closer to becoming becoming a, a commercial reality, but there's an awful lot of work to do. And one of the things that I think my generation needs to understand is that for these, uh, to complete the job of fusion, we need the ideas, the creativity, and the enthusiasm of another generation who are gonna come along and push it right through to completion. Um, fusion is needed. It's not just would be nice to have. Um, when we look at how we're going to get to net zero, <clears throat> There's, a, there's, you know, no question that we have to, um, uh, we have to develop fusion. Um, it's a, it's an uphill battle because this is one of the the biggest challenges that we've ever fa faced. Um, it is the energy source of the of the universe, and and as such, once we know how to do fusion um, in a commercial way, we'll never not know how to do fusion. And so it will change the whole future in a, in, in a way that's really difficult to really comprehend, actually. Um, but the story really starts 100 years ago. And I love this because this is one of the greatest uh, uh, public lectures on science that's ever been delivered. And the fellow delivering it was Arthur Stanley Eddington, probably the greatest theoretical astronomer of the first part of the 20th century. And he was pondering why the sun was hot why why is the sun hot and the traditional theories that had that the, the sun is just you know a cooling down self-gravitating piece of of, of 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 gas that's just falling in on itself and he said no it can't be it's much older than that it must have been burning for years and years and years and and you know wh why is it 15 million degrees in the middle um he was kind of lucky it's good to be lucky in science. Um, it helps um, because they just measured the mass of helium and hydrogen to great pre precision. F.W. Aston at Cambridge, actually, um, had measured the masses of the elements with enough precision to realize that that helium was a little less than four times hydrogen. 
but close enough that that couldn't be a coincidence. <clears throat> and so now Eddington was one of the first people to appreciate relativity. So he knew what missing mass meant. Missing mass meant with E equals MC squared meant there was some missing energy. So if you took four hydrogens and you put them together to make helium, you would have some energy left over, some mass left over, and that mass could be converted into energy. And if we use that energy, we could keep the sun hot. And he went on to kind of calculate the age of the sun to be about 15 billion years, which indeed it is. And, and um, well, it will be. Um, and it, it, it's just a, it, just a few numbers he puts it together a master of scientific deduction and, and and came up with this conclusion we didn't know anything about the nucleus in 1920 but we did know right that um e equals mc squared and that was all he had to use to conclude that most probably the sun was converting hydrogen into a helium by a process that he didn't really understand but he knew if it did it would create this amount of energy and that process is fusion, and indeed, that's exactly what the sun is doing. And he went on to say in this rather archaic kind of way, archaic and sexist, these were very different times, that this reservoir, the, the energy that you can get out of converting hydrogen into helium, can scarcely be other than the subatomic energy, which it is known exists abundantly in all matter. We sometimes dream that man, sorry about that, will one day learn how to release it and use it for his service. The store is well nigh inexhaustible if only it could be tapped. That's a hundred years ago. And we've been trying to do fusion roughly since the Second World War. Um, and we're getting close. And the United States government has got uh, to a realization that we're really gonna have, we're gonna need fusion to work. If we're going to get to net zero and remove uh, carbon emissions into the atmosphere, which is critical for the future of our planet, um, we're going to have to develop fusion. And so uh, last March, uh, we all met in the, in, in the White House with uh, some of the top leaders on the right hand side. You can see the top leaders in the middle in green is the Secretary of Energy, uh, the Department of Energy, um, and the leadership to really plot how we were going to deliver commercial fusion energy not just fusion but commercial fusion energy something that can compete on the marketplace and actually deliver electricity and there's a national academy of sciences report that says we should be delivering it between 2035 and 2040. now so i know some of the private companies in fusion are aiming to deliver faster than that but this is what we think we can do given a balanced a sort of approach to this it could all change if you had a smart idea tomorrow that would really accelerate the progress it could all change in a, in, a, in a heartbeat but this is sort of the deliberate you know public sector approach here you can see me standing in front of the white house it's it, it was kind of a thrill to be there um, um and this uh this report bringing fusion to the grid um is now the aim of the united states right to get fusion on they called it the bold decadal vision in the next decade in the 2030s um couldn't really be fast enough what is fusion um well you can do all kinds of fusion reactions because stars actually build all the, all the um atoms in your body are essentially made in stars by fusion processes that start with hydrogen build up everything you're just stardust but there's one fusion reaction that's a lot easier than the other one and this is between uh two kinds of hydrogen two rare kinds of hydrogen deuterium which is in seawater and there's enough deuterium to power the whole planet for 60 billion years and the planet is going to be swallowed by the sun in 4.5 billion so that's overkill um and tritium which is heavy super heavy hydrogen which you have to make from lithium so this re reaction up here is getting deuterium and tritium and you have to ram them together at great speed and they stick and they make helium they for a moment they this is in this picture for those in the know the green particles are the positively charged protons and the blue particles are neutrons when you put deuterium and tritium together for a moment you make helium five and then it splits up into ordinary helium helium four plus a neutron then you take that neutron and you bombard lithium which you can extract from seawater and you make helium 
and tritium, and you put your tritium back in the, in, in, into the reactor. There's no radioactive uh, byproducts, no carbon dioxide, nothing. And there's enough lithium in seawater to power the planet for 30 million years. And presumably, if we get good at doing this kind of fusion, in the future, we'll be able to do more complicated fusion reactions. It turns out, though, in order to get this to happen, you've got to have a temperature of about 100 to 200 million degrees. So how do you hold the system at 100 or 200 million degrees so that you cause fusion to happen? Um, that's complicated. This bit, which is turning lithium into tritium, that can be your heat exchanger, where you turn, you turn the energy from fusion into steam and then power a turbine and make electricity. Now, the crazy thing is we've actually done this. We've actually made fusion happen. And the first uh, controlled fusion reaction um, really happened here at Princeton in 1994. On this green line over here, TFDR was a Princeton machine. And in 1994, we made 10 million watts of fusion power, basically 10 megajoules of fusion, which is a one megajoule is a convenient unit here. It's the energy of a candy bar or an energy of a grenade. The only difference between candy bars and grenades is one goes much faster than the other. Um, this was the, the the world record power, and it still is the world record power, is held by the joint European Taurus at 16 megawatts, but a very short pulse, you know, just over a second. And here was Jet in 1997, the same machine, producing uh, 22 megajoules of energy. Last December, Jet produced 59 megajoules of energy, sustained over 10 million watts for over five seconds. This is in preparation for ETA because Jet is the, the baby brother of, of ETA, well, the older, older brother <laughs> of ETA, it, but, but about half the size. Um, and this was fantastic. It really showed that we could sustain fusion reactions. And that was terrific. And then just two weeks ago, the other way to do fusion had a major breakthrough. This was on the 5th of December of, of this year uh, at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. A massive laser delivered two megajoules of laser light to a capsule that's about the size of a peppercorn. And out of that came three megajoules of fusion. So this is a hand grenade the size of a peppercorn, basically making three hand grenades worth of en energy. Fantastic. Uh, unbelievable stuff. Um, and they had solved over a period of 10 years, they'd solved all the scientific problems that were in their way. And they got to this ignition point with this. And so we have two kinds of fusion lining up to see which one can deliver commercial fusion first. I'm a person who thinks fusion is so important that we need many ideas, not even just two, lots of ideas and push them forward as rapidly as possible so we can do it. Why fusion? I mean, look, we, we all know that renewable energy is um, is doing fantastically well. The, the, the revolution in renewable energy to bring down the cost, to make it cheap, to produce wind power and solar power is fantastic. And the way we're going to push, you know, oil out of the market and gas out of the market is just outcompeting them. Right. We're going to we're going to push them out of the market by having cheap renewable energy. And uh, there's a plan that came out of Princeton called the Net Zero America plan. And excuse me being a bit parochial here, um, but I am in America at this point in my life. Um, and this plan is to decarbonize America by 2050. And they came up with six scenarios. You can see them here. These are mixtures of primary energy sources. This is business as usual, this left hand, from 2020 through to 2050. And how you remove oil, gas, and coal from the American energy system on that time scale so we can get to net zero. Not a little bit of carbon, net zero in that time scale. And the one that, um, and what's amazing about this is going to cost a lot of money. These, these things will cost about, um, this is the in cost in trillions over that time. But the one that really uh, seems to be most attractive is this one here with the orange line, which is the orange is conventional nuclear power. And we all know that conventional nuclear power, while it may help us with the climate crisis, is not a long-term solution. We don't want to be producing that kind of waste. We don't necessarily want to be using that much uranium. Um, it's not the long-term solution. 
on that time. But if we don't have something that can fill the gap with renewables, when the wind doesn't blow, when the sun doesn't shine, right, we will not be able to go to net zero. And this, um, it was actually put in a very nice context by a recent paper in 20, well, recent 2018, um, where they looked at the average cost of, of electricity as a function of the emissions limit. Um, basically, this is grams per kilowatt hour. So grams of carbon per kilowatt hour. So if you said you're allowed to emit a little bit of carbon uh, for, to make your energy, you know, that would be one gram or five grams per kilowatt hour. But we want to get to zero. And what you can see is that the cost of electricity goes up steeply if you just go with renewables, just renewables, just uh, solar and, and wind. You've got to fill in the gap between them. And this is what we call firm energy sources, firm low carbon energy sources. And fusion would be the perfect one because it would be able to be turned on when, when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow because it's abundant because it does not produce any carbon, does not produce any long-term radioactive waste, and it's um, very safe. So if we can make it work, it makes the whole system work. And that's why fusion is such an important contrib contributor to the system. When you make electricity, so I'm, I'm moving on, I'm just this is a summary of where we are, right? Um, you have a system that does fusion, but in the end, you've got to make electricity. So we do that essentially by taking the heat that's produced out of this system, boiling water, firing a tur turbine, and making electricity from it in a very conventional kind of way. This is what we're all aiming to do. And, uh, and, and we're aiming to do it by heating the fuel to 200 million degrees. I think in, in the middle of ETA, it's projected about 250 million degrees is the sort, sort of the best operating temperature. And of that, your fuel is in this marvelous form of, of ionized matter called a plasma. And we've been confining plasmas now for about 70 years in, in the lab, refining the, the bottle made of the magnetic field that squeezes down the plasma and holds it in place while it does fusion reactions. Not always does it hold it. You can see in this picture on the right-hand side from the machine at, at, in, in the UK called MAST, you can see it erupting at some time, almost like the surface of the sun. These are little suns in a bottle. I have to say that I think with all the activity that's happening, we've had you know, investment in fusion in the last few years of over $5 billion uh, in the United States in startup companies. But still, the most important experiment of the 21st century is indeed ITER. Because this is the machine on which we can really get to experiment and understand how to do fusion in detail. This is a bit of an earlier picture than the one that... Uh, uh, you, you were shown a moment ago. Um, I don't have access to the latest pictures or I haven't looked, looked them up at this point, but it's one of the great wonders of the world right now. You go and stand in the middle of this engineering and it's just awe-inspiring. And that's where the machine will be. It's like, you know, five meters, the, that radius of the donut in which you contain the deuterium and tritium and make the fusion happen five meters across. Superconducting magnets, incredible stuff. And I like this picture because, you know, going abseiling is fun, but abseiling down a, 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 a sector of ETA, now that must be really fun. Now, ETA is going to do what we all really want to do with fusion. We want to make fusion energy without having to put any energy in. And uh, it's approaching these conditions that we really want to see happen rapidly because that's sort of that. It, once that's been achieved, we know that the science is possible. And, you know, I did show you the pictures, uh, the, the, the numbers from the laser experiment. They were putting two megajoules in to get three megajoules out. And the electricity needed to make that two megajoules of laser light was 300 megajoules. So we need to get to a point where we're not using electricity, we're making electricity. And so I like this. This is a computer simulation of the behavior of ETA from some years ago. And it's benchmarked against some of the experiments that we've done at Princeton and some of the experiments in, in Europe. Let me just explain what's happening in this picture. Along the bottom, you've got time. And what happens at time t equals zero 
is you fill your machine eater, which has these big superconducting coils that are on at that time, with deuterium and tritium. Then what you do up until you get to this brown line here is you, you induce ITER to have a current of about 15 million amps of electricity that goes around the loop. At that point, it starts to attract itself because light currents attract. It's a simple physics thing. Light currents attract. And so the great wadge of current attracts itself and you form this magnetic bottle. Then at this point, when we turn this brown, these are the heater beams. And the heater beams go into into ITER and heat it up from about 10 million degrees, right up to 20, 20, 25 million, de, uh, uh, 200, sorry, 200, 250 million degrees. And you can see the blue line. Now, the, this is an experiment. So in fact, in these simulations, we tried out different things, right? But the blue line is probably the most closest to what we think ITER will do. And what happens is you, as you pour in energy is it heats up, and this is lighting your fire. At this point, you've got to the temperatures where fusion happens. And what we see is this is fusion power on the right-hand side. We've got about 500 megawatts of fusion power. That's about half the size of a big power station. And that's pouring out energy across the, out of the device. And then at 400 seconds, we do something very interesting. <clears throat> We, we remove the, the external heat and it keeps going at that point. And we don't know whether ITER will quite get to this point. But if it does, we'll be producing fusion with zero input power. And that's that's the holy grail. If we can produce fusion power with zero input power, then we have, you know, the, the scientific conditions for the perfect energy source. We don't know yet if we can take that and convert it into a commercial object. But we're pretty certain that ITER will reach these conditions. Everything indicates from our current experiments that this will happen. What I'm not convinced about is can we actually then turn it into something that will make commercial electricity that people want to buy? Because we need to do that. And fortunately, this is being supplemented now by a huge enthusiasm from private companies all over the world, um, and particularly in the United States, but in Europe, in Japan, etc. This was 4.7 billion in investment, but since I wrote this slide, there's been more investment uh, in this. And these companies are working on the job, not of just showing fusion exists, but that fusion is commercially realizable. Um, I think this is a very exciting time. And what I'd like to say is if you're interested in doing something that would, could be very important for the planet, making fusion work has got to be one of the best ones to do. Um, I always describe it as the perfect energy source with one hiccup. We don't yet know how to do it in a commercial way. But when we do, we'll never not know how to do it in a commercial way. It's safe. It doesn't have any waste. It's abundant. It has minimal land use. You know, what, what, what could be more perfect? So development is not optional. And the world's governments are spending considerable amounts of, of money but we must push down the cost and the scale if we get to market. And so welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Your points about new developments in plasma physics and um, opportunities in this field, especially for youth are incredibly fascinating. Um, I will now turn over to, I will now turn over the chair to Jane. Um, who has kindly agreed to chair the final two parts of this workshop, uh, the panel with our fusion science and education experts, and the resulting Q&A with everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Jonah. And I just, I want to um, give a, a quick set, a quick round of applause to both um, Laban and, and Steve. Um, they, I think they gave a really good sense for all of you not only of the complexity, but of the opportunity. And from my perspective, um, the, you know, it doesn't matter where you enter it. Their fusion energy is going to touch your lives. It already is in the, in this, in the form of sunlight, but fusion as a commercial energy source is all of our jobs. 
because it is one of the few disruptive options out there that we have not applied to climate that really could make that difference. So we have to make it soon enough. Um, and as a non-physicist, I get to be the internal optimist that says, these guys are brilliant. You all listening are brilliant. There are many other brilliant minds working on how to capture this star in a bottle. And I hope there will be more people joining ECG and our work in making it understood and uh, bringing the commercial uses to meet this new power source, because that's, that is another holy grail. We use a lot of different um, great sounding uh, terms like holy grail or Wright Brothers or first fire. Um, and most of these tend to end up in male dominated spaces. I will just say as a female who's been alone in energy for a very long time, I welcome all of you. And I don't care what your gender is, what your race is, what your nationality is. We can't have enough interest and, um, and intelligence coming at this because this crew is going to launch it. You're gonna take it. Um, so with that, I'm gonna send you on to Arturo and Pablo and Kayla, all of whom probably look a little bit closer to you in age and are working on approaches and thinking about how to take this concept and bring it into the worlds that you all inhabit. I'm not gonna introduce either one of our speakers. I'm gonna let them give two seconds on who they are. But I also encourage each one of the three speakers not to get shy. Give your story because your stories matter. Your stories explain to others why there's room. So with that, um, I think we're going to start with um, Dr. Pablo Rodriguez Fernandez, since he is the first to have to leave us, and then we'll move from there. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And hello, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be in this panel. Um, I'm Pablo Rodriguez Fernandez. I'm an MIT research scientist, and I've been around the world of fusion for the past seven years when I started my PhD work here at MIT. Um, so why are fusion and renewables so important? That was the, the focus question here. And I think probably in this audience, everyone agrees that uh, climate change and energy security are two very big deals that our and, fu and future generations will have to face. Um, and this really comes from the last century when we decided to build our modern societies around fossil fuels. And even though this has brought a lot of like good things, prosperity, progress, it has made people's lives better. Um, this was maybe in hindsight, not such a good thing. And we know that now, and we also know that we need to renew our entire energy infrastructure as a consequence. And this is not going to be easy uh, because the problem here is that uh, fossil fuels, it turns out that they're really efficient at what they do at producing energy for different, like diver our diverse energy needs, like say residential heating or car industry or electricity. Uh, so, and also the fact is that we're not going to stop using energy. In fact, it will increase as more societies develop as we reach higher development levels. And if we want to sustain our lifestyles, we need an alternative that we don't have right now. And we have to really focus our efforts globally towards achieving this goal. Um, and the interesting thing has been that historically, there has been a trade-off between you know, prosperity and energy and climate. And we think, and I think my colleagues in Fusion would agree that technology uh, is a solution to this, so that we don't have to decide whether we are environmentally friendly or prosperous society. Um, and this doesn't mean that fusion is the only solution. Actually, Jane clearly pointed this out in the, in the remarks. We need really a lot of alternatives and we need to develop and implement them globally in situations where they are fit and efficient for the right application. For example, a mix of having renewables for solar panels in houses, having baseload energy generation for you know, power cities and, and industries uh, with, from, from fusion and also fission and geothermal and hydroelectric in those places where, where those are available. So in short, we, I think we need to, to use every arrow in our quiver to reach our, uh, a sustainable society and the development of renewables and fusion are our big, big bets uh, for that. Um, what are the most exciting 
um, developments in the te technology in my view and what's my role. So in my view, there is in the field of fusion, by the way, it's uh, rapidly evolving and the future ahead of us is really, really exciting. Um, I don't think that there is a single one innovation that is really driving all these changes. I think it's more of a synergy between different advancements and, and developments. Um, first of all, there is like all this momentum from the last decades. Uh, we have seen the announcements by, by NEF, Inertial Confinement, a few days ago, and the, the amazing progress in the construction of ITER. And that comes because of all the work that has been done in the past decades. Um, but also there are new developments in other fields that are not necessarily fusion, that, are, that is making that is increasing the probability of economic success of fusion so that we can build more optimized designs at smaller scales and iterate more quickly. Things like superconductors and magnets, which is what we do here at MIT, um, but also like machine learning, control systems, additive manufacturing, simulation tools that are getting better and better. And it's when we put all these things together, when we are able to bring fusion closer. Um, and the question, uh, the question also asked, um, what is my, my, my role in this? So I personally work on, on plasma simulation. I work on uh, making those simulations faster and more efficient with machine learning techniques. So I work towards um, making, having better predictive capabilities for fusion reactors, uh, just as a personal note there. Um, so what are opportunities uh, for students to get involved? Um, the reality is that if you're already, you're listening, attending to this workshop, you are already involved. You're already interested. And that's the most important part here. Um, engage in conversations that occur around you on energy issues, on environment goals, on fusion energy and renewable developments. Um, because the thing is that in this field, in fusion and in climate in general, there is a lot to do. And having a lot to do also means that there is a lot of opportunity to make a change, like to make to have an impact to make a better world. Uh, and that's very, very exciting. And we don't need to be a plasma physicist to work on fusion anymore. Um, we need people from all sciences, from all backgrounds. There's a huge need for people on that works on superconductivity, robotics, cryogenics, material science, things like that. But also not only on sciences and engineering, we need uh, policymakers, we need lawyers, we need business people that, makes, um, that would accelerate this progress. So I encourage you as a final note here, I encourage you all to look around you for opportunities um, from things like visits to labs. Um, actually, before I started in the, in, working in Fusion, I attended uh, Eater's Open Doors Days uh, that uh, Leiban mentioned. Uh, so that was really exciting. And then I started working on Fusion. Um, so, and also look for internships, opportunities and, and, and la at labs. Um, I remember that in the press conference from the NIF results a few days ago, most of the scientists involved in the experiments said that they started in the field because of an internship as an undergrad, uh, that they worked at the lab and then they stayed and they are now making history. Um, so yeah, look for those opportunities. Uh, and uh, it, look, and even if you don't, you don't like fusion is not your passion or your, your main interest, that's, that's also fine. Like engaging like, climate action communities, like come to workshops like this one to learn and you'll eventually find your right place because there's a place for everyone. We need everyone to make this, this happen. So yeah, that's my, my contribution here. Thank you very much. And Pablo, knowing that you have to leave, I just want to thank you personally now so that yeah. when, you, when you leave us, um, I'll know that we, we've expressed our gratitude Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn the, the microphone to Kayla, um, in part because my she she's a member of the ECG team, and I'm incredibly proud of the launch of our first actual education pilot that she has initiated. And um, as a woman and a young woman, relatively, um, starting this process, uh, and as one who found us which is what Pablo just uh, alluded to. You know, if you're interested, you can look to the panel that you're seeing right now. You can Google Fusion, or you can attend any one of a number of other workshops and see who, who intrigues you and follow up. Kayla did, and she persisted. So she gets the gold star as far as I'm concerned. We hadn't even thought about this particular pilot before we met Kayla. So with that, I'm gonna turn, um, 
the mic to Kayla to uh, answer the questions of um, what the most exciting developments are that you've seen since you've joined this effort, but more importantly, what your role is and what you've just launched, because I think that is something all can learn from. So hi, everyone. My name is Kayla Miller, and I am the Director of Education at ECG. And I just want to thank Jonah for putting this event together, and thank you for inviting me as a panelist. I'm really honored to speak among such distinguished members of the Fusion community. So I see myself as a translator in the Fusion sector, making complicated things easier to understand for different audiences. As a Director of Education at ECG, I create communicate and distribute age re relevant fusion education materials. So this week ECG started our education work by launching our first pilot program for a group of fifth graders at Page Elementary School in Schenectady City School District called the Generation Fusion Pilot Program. So we're really excited that that is underway. Um, so why fusion? It's no secret that we need to stop releasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere because we're making Earth uninhabitable for ourselves and other species. So that being said, we know the, consequ the consequences of the climate crisis, especially young people. So I often ask groups of students that I work with, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say climate change? And they'll tell me things like wildfires, rising sea levels, droughts, more extreme weather, hurricanes, things of that nature. So fusion and renewables are so important right now because they offer hope and complementary solutions that will work well together in the face of these consequences. So imagine a world where there's a practically limitless source of energy for everyone that doesn't release any greenhouse gases, that has minimal waste that isn't radioactive, and then it uses a tiny amount of seawater for fuel. Like this isn't a figment of our imaginations. We're closer than we've ever been before to this new source of energy. So what brings me the most, ex what, <laughs> what, what's the most exciting recent development in this space? And I'd say what the panelists and other speakers have mentioned so far is that NIF, what happened last week was that their lasers were able to get more power out of their fusion process than the energy it took to start it. So before fusion's big challenge was that it takes a lot of energy to create the star on earth, resulting in less power out of the process. So more energy in, less power out. So now for the first time in history, we have proof. We know for sure that achieving ignition is possible for fusion energy, meaning less energy in and more power out. So I think the most evident UN sustainable development goals that fusion address, addresses are SDG 13, Climate Action, SDG 7, Affordable and Clean Energy, and then SDG 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities. So a less obvious application for fusion that intrigues me is water desalination. So removing salt from seawater for quality drinking water, and um, that addresses SDG 6, which is clean water and sanitation. So SDG 8, Decent Work and Economic Growth, and SDG 10, reduced inequalities are people-centric goals. So the fusion sector has the ability to create jobs with dignity and provide electricity to over 700 million people in the world that currently don't have it. And what are the opportunities here? So we're talking about a brand new commercial industry. Fusion isn't just a source of energy, it's a new commercial sector. So that means that as the technology advances, there's going to be more opportunities in different areas that will advance as well. So for example, we need fusion power plant designers that can design fusion devices to work with renewables so we can all have clean power. We'll need highly skilled electricians and welders that specialize in fusion and building fusion technology. We'll need more material scientists. So they'll work on materials that can withstand temperatures that are hotter than the sun. And so we also need communicators like myself that are explaining fusion broadly so everyone can know about it. So I think the most relevant opportunity to young people right now that they can start today is talking about it. Talk about fusion to anyone and everyone that you know and even people that you don't know. Tell them what makes you excited about it. Post on social media about it, which you guys are experts in. And your generation will be making the choices as we move forward and inherit a warmer earth. So 
we hope you'll choose fusion as a major solution and soon enough to make a difference on climate change. So. Well, that was a pleasure, especially as, as the head of ECG, I don't often get to listen to the people who are doing the real work. And this so far has just been uh, a walk in the park for me. And I, I, I love to see um, the voices that are representing fusion today versus the voices I saw representing fusion 10 years ago. We're already seeing change and we've got a lot more to, to build. Um, Arturo, I don't know of anybody who's thought about that more than you have as one of the community builders within the science community uh, working on fusion in the United States and in all other communities. Um, I wish there were more of you and Steffi Diem and other colleagues that I've had the pleasure of working with um, around the world to uh, to get the conversations rolling and then and then um, lead the way. But I don't need to tell this group what you're going to do and what you do today. You're much better at it. Arturo, why don't you take it from here? <laughs> Thank you so much, Jane. Can you all hear me? Uh, all right. Um, thanks for that introduction. And, and wow, Kayla is a tough act to, to follow. That was so inspirational. I think that was fantastic. Very well said. And all the other panelists and speakers, I think really eloquently put all of the, the points that I, that I, that, that I would like to highlight. But let me first introduce myself. I'm Arturo Dominguez. I am originally from Bogota, Colombia. I actually started studying physics in Columbia and then transferred to UT Austin, by the way, Hook and Horns, um, and finished my physics uh, degree there. And then I got excited uh, about fusion and um, got a doctorate at uh, MIT. I worked on the machine that Pablo got um, to work on at the end of, of, of its run. Uh, I think actually, Pablo, we, we didn't overlap but by, by like a few months. And when I was uh, when I was finishing my PhD, I was working uh, on a diagnostic on an instrument that that measured uh, density at you know fluctuations and turbulence, all these really important and exciting um, uh, physics phenomena at the edge of the plasma. But I really got interested in really sharing the message of fusion and um, getting uh, folks involved in this grand challenge. Of fusion. And so I started at PPPL in the department that I now lead, the science education department. And I've been there for 10 years. Um, so the my really the, the, the focus that I that I would like to to, um, to you know the, the focus that I that I would like to share here, I think it's already been shared a lot, that we're in a new age in which we really need to go beyond. The, the plasma physics, the physics. We need a broad skill set to join and to push us forward. Um, uh, Laban and, and Steve really um, laid the framework of what are how, how this industry is actually going to grow in the next few years with the recent exciting advances in technology and in science. And we're going to need uh, folks, talented individuals in all levels, in all in all fields, to help. Um, to help power this industry forward, this ecosystem forward, and get to uh, a fusion future in which we uh, are developing fusion technologies in all sides. Um, I recently got a, a question in, a, in an interview about, like, you know, I, I think the question was framed, um, do you think uh, fusion is going to save the world? Um, my answer is, I don't know, actually. I I don't know if fusion will save the world, but I know that without fusion, we are seeing a bleak future, right? The, the, as, as has been pointed out by panel members, climate change is not only real, it's coming fast, right? It's an exponential increase of, 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 of catastrophic effects that will come in the future unless we decarbonize our, our world. And we have to put we have to use everything, everything at our that, that at our power to 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 counteract this. So we need all renewables. We I believe we need fission. 
We need fusion. We need baseload sources. We need advances in the energy grid. We need to put everything into this battle of, of climate change. And we need to, to bring everybody along. So I'm particularly excited about the work that Kayla's doing of getting young folks involved and really knowledgeable about what are what you know what is this exciting field that's moving forward and how you can be a part of it from from different sides and uh, yeah and and as Jane was was alluding to in in our department that's our main focus is is how can we get the word out there how can we bring people into the field and so I'd like to. Uh, get the opportunity to share some of the resources that we have. I just put uh, a course when you when, when you have some free time, take a look at all the great work that's being done um, in plasma infusion. And also, if if that's okay, I'd like to give you all the opportunity to play with a plasma and do some magnetic confinement on your own. This is a plasma that can be controlled from anywhere in the world that is currently in our lab um, and that you can go in and, and, and control it and, and, and you yourself get a chance to interact with plasma. Um, opportunities, I mean, there are opportunities, there are a lot of job opportunities in the future. Uh, there are internships, uh, uh, EDER has some great internships uh, and we at PBPL uh, and in the US have a lot of internships and, and job opportunities to share. Um, and we can we can share that uh, uh, with you, Jane, in the future. But I don't want to take up the time here. Um, I think that, that's all I will say right now. But but thank you so much for having me here, and and it's so exciting to see this enthusiasm moving forward. Well, I'm just going to say that that um, Arturo was being very um, self-effacing there because. Um, as the United States looks at fusion from a commercial vantage point, there's increasing uh, realization of the the workforce we have, the workforce we don't have, and the community itself, um, which is uh, a community that has aged through the process of, of uh, research and has not replaced itself well enough in a diverse population. And one of the things I've seen um, Arturo and um, Steffi Diem and others lead is a conversation within the community that inspires that community to look beyond itself. And um, I think from their vantage point being not quite so um, awe-inspiring or, or far away as perhaps Sir Stephen Cowley or uh, Dennis White in his position at MIT or any of the other named leaders, um, you have people who are approachable in multiple labs and in multiple universities. So um, I would say, you know, these are people to make your first call to because if they can't help you, well, you can always call us. Um, but I wanna, I wanna move us on and um, shockingly, I think we're ahead of time, which is almost an unheard of in uh, fusion conversations. In fact, certainly ones that I've been involved in and certain people on, the, on this uh, uh, panel know this especially well. And I know other panelists here who shocked me with their brevity, um, which is great because that means we really have time for, for, for questions. And I know a lot of them have been asked and answered in the chat feature. Um, I do want to make sure that the websites and links um, that Arturo just shared, we find a way to share to the group because I think they're an internal share. I believe, no, I believe they were shared. They were, okay. they were bounced. So, so Good. yes. Yep. Good. Uh, as long as everybody's got them. And um, so having, you know, well, I, I'm just awe-inspired by Pablo, by Arturo, and by Kayla. Well, Kayla, obviously, because I know her a little bit better than others. And because she's female. I mean, come on, guys. Really? Um, with that, I'm going to move us. In. It says roundtable in closing, but I don't feel like we're closing yet. I think we're just getting started. And I'd like to, to welcome as many questions in this process as possible. I know that there's been a request, and I will just reiterate it, that the questions that come in are asked, um, and the author of the question 
identifies himself so that we can both thank you, but also have a sense of, you know, where is the interest coming from? Um, Jonah, I would ask you to add any, any, many, you know, any ideas that you had that I've forgotten there. Well, yeah, I'm, I've already um, recorded down a few questions that people sort of, um, when they were answering said, this is a great question effectively. Um, so first one um, from, um, I apologize greatly for any mispronunciations. Um, Vanishvav um, Vinod um, from the UAE, um, Shasha Indian School. Um, what will be the substitute for tritium if it one day disappears? Um, I think Stephen really wanted to answer that one. Well, the, the, probably the next easiest one is uh, of the fusion reactions would be to do fusing deuterium with itself. And that really puts us in, uh, it's, it's harder. You need a hotter temperature. You need a temperature that is, um, you know, sort of half a billion degrees. Um, but, you, but when you get uh, to those temperatures, of course, you don't have to make deuterium. It exists in seawater. It's very easy to extract from seawater. Um, and there's enough deuterium in seawater to simply power the planet until the planet is no more. So um, that's probably the next easiest fusion reaction to do. There is a company out of uh, Irvine, California, called Tri Alpha Energy, that's trying to do a fusion reaction between the proton, which is ordinary hydrogen, and boron, which you can extract from rocks. And proton-boron fusion um, has the advantages of never involving any neutrons at all. And the advantage of that is that, you know, you, you, when you have neutrons around, they are, um, you know, they, they, can, they can damage your solids, they can activate your solids, that, that, that kind of thing. And so Tri-Alpha has raised well over a billion dollars um, to look at proton-boron fusion. And if they got that going before we got deuterium, tritium uh, fusion going, um, that's probably the route we would take. Um, because it, it 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 has some some advantages, but it's much harder. I would just follow up and say that that maybe maybe with the question there might have been a misunderstanding that tritium. I mean, tritium doesn't exist naturally in nature. We have to make it. That's why we use lithium. And there and there is an uh, there is a lot of lithium uh, in on Earth that we can use for hundreds of years. And from the seawater, we can get it for hundreds of thousands to millions of years if, if we develop the technology for that. So, so there, is, there is a way of getting the tritium from lithium. And I would just also add that the, the, the challenge of lithium is for us to develop the kind of practices around the extraction of lithium that match the, uh, the sustainable and, and humanitarian goals embedded in all of the UN's effort, efforts. And I'm thinking specifically about some of the mining practices, but there have been advan advances and are, are ongoing advances in the brine from geothermal and many other ways of finding, of, of, of collecting lithium for the use of fusion. And let's face it, the things powering the, com the computers we're all staring through, the batteries themselves, so. Yeah, they, they, I mean, it's very interesting. Lithium is incredibly important uh, at this point in time for obviously electric vehicles, bat laptop batteries, et cetera. And the world's sources of lithium are um, are in places where, you know, mining and mining practices perhaps haven't is being friendly to the indigenous people, for instance, in those places. So one of the things, and this could be a major breakthrough, is to simplify the way we extract lithium from seawater. There's 0.2 milligrams per liter of seawater of lithium. And that's not very much lithium, obviously. But if you can come up with membrane technologies and various other ways of pulling it out of seawater, then of course, lithium will not be, you know, in this country, in those person's backyard, it will be everywhere. And, and, it's not inconceivable that you can come up with a membrane that lets lithium through and doesn't let the sodium 
because the, the the confounder obviously is sodium <laughs> as you know seawater has a lot of sodium chloride in it and the lithium is sort of like sodium and and, and it is easy uh, difficult to distinguish but there are these new membranes that allow the lithium through so there's there's you know some really neat ideas there Jonah, do you have the control of the questions in the order that, that you're seeing them? I see them in different ways. Yeah, okay. I I mean, I've sort of noted down three other questions that I right. think would be really interesting to hear the panel's views on. Um, so, um, once again, apologies for pronunciation. Um, Ardish Arkaya, um, how does the magnetic field in the top of Mac ensure the energy generated by burning plasma does not get out of hand? Um, from Delhi Private School um, in the UAE. Um, then also, is fusion energy better than nuclear energy? Um, Anya Bas Basnet um, from year four in um, Pristine Private School, Dubai. Um, and then also, what inspired you to do the um, ITER project um, of trying, or in general, trying to get fusion on Earth. Um, from Anya um, Anaja, um, from our own English high school, uh, high school strategist, um, Girls Branch. So I'm sure that many of us can answer various aspects of this question, but if you like, I can, uh, I can start, Jonah. Um, I'll start with a third question, what inspired me to be Eacher? Because I think that um, I'm a late bloomer. I think that, that there are some distinguished people here like Sir Stephen or Arturo who, who came much earlier. Uh, Jane has been in the fusion area longer than I have. But the simplest answer I can give you about what inspires me to be part of a project like Eacher is my daughter. You know, we, we think in terms of uh, the energy legacy that we have inherited that we know is destroying the planet. I mean, Kayla spoke about that really eloquently. And it's it's, it's really nice to hear somebody um, at, at Kayla's age. Jane already made the point that Stephen and I are very old. So um, in comparison, that the others are younger in comparison to uh, to, to the rest of you. And, 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 you know, I think about what we, uh, people of my age have inherited, and we have the chance with fusion to do something really rare, which is to give a solution, to give uh, a better legacy to you all than what we inherited. So that's that to me is is what inspired me to work at ITER. And um, I, I want to take a very brief sidelight. There's been a question floating around in, in various places. Arturo touched on it. It was also another question you haven't yet read, Jonah, about jobs and so forth. And um, I wanna answer that question a little bit obliquely. So I'm gonna share my screen and I'll, I'll just show you a place that you can look. So if you go on the, on the oh great, now I can't see it. Uh, how do I minimize that? Um, if you go on the ETER website, um, you can see here at the top jobs and if you click on that jobs uh idea that, that jobs panel you'll see here internships and maybe something jane that we could work on at ecg maybe it's already a plan is to put a whole bunch of internships around the world as uh you know like different places that you can go but if you click on jobs or if you click uh, for example if you click on jobs here you're going to see some of the fields that you could go into so structural design engineer, magnet assembly technician. And if you click on any of those, you can see what degree fields are needed. So if you want to get into this area, you can you can see all the different things that go into making a project like ITER. If you look at, in fact, we've got here, we're hiring a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer, right? We have project managers, et cetera. And then if you go into internships, you can also see, um, uh, you will see a bunch of information FAQs, et cetera. And then there are about 65 internships that you can see there that will get you to a whole range of fields. 
Many of those are going to be with a, an undergraduate university degree, either finished or in process. Some will be at the graduate level. And for those who asked about a high school degree, Jonah is a great example because what inspired this particular workshop is that Jonah came here for a week plus a couple of remote work weeks of teleworking um, over the past summer. And, you know, super brilliant guy. Maybe not all of you will do what Jonah did, but Jonah came out and, and he was already, he knew a lot about fusion and he really wanted to communicate his enthusiasm. So we do have really meaningful ways of, uh, of bringing you in. Come back to the first question, which is how do you control a plasma? Uh, Sir Stephen and Arturo can probably talk about that uh, better than I can, but the a lot of what we do is control systems that have to do things like respond in one ten thousandth of a second. And we have ability to shoot little little pellets bigger than has ever been done before because they're ether scale, little pellets of hydrogen in that can kind of control when the plasma gets into a into an, a less balanced configuration. But because of the temperatures and engineering precision involved, they have to respond very quickly. So I'll stop there. I can also back Laban up on that. Um, thank you for the internship opportunity. It was absolutely incredible. Um, and I highly recommend to try and go to ITER for anyone who, um, you know, that's a possibility. Was there a question on um, what nuclear is better? Am I right about that, Jonah? Um, yes, I believe yes, there was. Okay. Um, well, I don't want to say what's better or what's worse, but with nuclear fusion, you don't have any radioactive waste. With fission, you do, among other things. But I also want to just mention that the word nuclear tends to have like a knee-jerk reaction for most people, and most people think about bombs and things of that nature. So when we say nuclear, I want you guys to be thinking about the nucleus of an atom rather than bombs and violence and war. So just wanted to say that. Thank, thank you, Kayla. And I was gonna offer that uh, one of the things that, one of the exercises that ECG did several years ago in determining um, where it was gonna start from on fusion. And we did a, a very large um, analytics a survey of of known uh, communications in energy generally across. At that point, it was the English speaking world because some of us are are less uh, verbally skilled than all of you listening. Um, and it was easier to to gather the forty thousand um, social media hits to to analyze there. And there was no bias in this. It was simply what was being discussed and where were the opinions being formed. And that's what brought us to fusion because fusion of the clean energy options out there, fusion was the only thing, the only type of technology, the only energy source known or coming that didn't have some negative, I mean, there were negative and positives, but it was alone in its, um, its, its, its general lack of knowledge, but also lack of, reaction negatively. And that's why we start with fusion and we talk about it as fusion. And then we get into what creates the fusion. Uh, I think you've muted, but I'm gonna take the word. Um, so one, one quick thing, the first question was how do magnets confine the plasma? So I just really wanted to share this because this is pretty cool. So this is the, the one of the links that I shared with you, this control that you can control from home. This There's gas in there, just normal gas. And there's an electromagnet right here. And right now everything is off. And there's energy through a voltage that I can provide. I'm going to turn on the plasma by putting a big voltage there between the ends. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on that electromagnet. And let's see what happens. So the magnet has confine the plasma to the center of that cylinder, right? You can see it, I'm, I'm gonna turn off the light. So if your machine is the glass tube, your plasma has been confined to the center and now you're not burning your glass. Now imagine putting this as a donut and there's your token. That's it. Question. Um, 
yeah, so thank you all for those answers. Um, the, that's some incredible stuff. Um, I will make sure to share all of the links um, and any other resources um, in an email coming later to everyone, um, I think, with the recording as well for this event. Um, for next questions, some ones that stood out, um, how long would it take to complete um, this project? I think that is talking about ITER. Um, although I, I think a timescale question in general for Fusion could be quite interesting. Um, and the other one from um, Femi Fatola um, from Nigeria, what plans are there to ensure the impacts of mining materials need to build um, fusion energy do not result in another crisis, um, considering the highly impact, the high impacts of um, mining to the present global warming and how the process um, will be just at the African countries. Um, both of those seem incredibly interesting. Um, if anyone wants to share their thoughts. Well, I assume that that's going to be for, uh, certainly Laban will take some of it and others will jump in. But before Laban says it, I want to just offer to all, um, I have never seen ITER as, you know, the the proof of energy out of fusion in this particular device. It is our practice. And we've also, because there are so many analogies to the hard science and the hard um, challenges that humanity has has leaped through, that there's been a lot of discussion about the space and about the Apollo project. I look at, at ITER as our practice moon. It's larger than any device would be made on, on the planet likely to produce energy. But it is, as I think it was uh, uh, Steve Cowley who said, look at what you can, there's no other place to inspire on this level. I mean, we've been, fusion is now in fashion. That's how far we've reached because we have a fashion and climate leader who's come into Eater and saw it firsthand, saw the beauty through her artistic eyes of the engineering and the complexity of the physics. So you can go there now and as an educational asset, I think Eater's uh, Eater's as good as it gets right now and will only get better. Thanks, Jane. Um, look, I Jane made that remark, uh, that brilliant thing about ITER. If 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 fusion is a moonshot, ITER is your practice moon. I heard her say that probably a year ago or something. I'm not sure exactly, and I've been using it ever since. I I do give you credit whenever I can, Jane. But it's you know it's a great it's a great illustration. Um, I, I want to say it in this way, and then I'm going to come back to this timing question. How long will it take? Uh, I talked to Dennis White, who is an MIT professor that uh, Pablo works with and who was the inspiration behind um, one of the US private sector projects, Commonwealth Fusion. You might hear about it as Spark and so forth. And I said, you know, because everybody asks this question about timing. Every journalist that talks to me, and I talked to a ton of them, eight of them so far this week, is asking, you know, how long? How long will this take, et cetera? And you talk to, if you ask, how long will it take because before fusion becomes a practical source of energy, the right answer is nobody knows, but if you ask 50 different scientists and engineers working in fusion, they would all have different answers. And the right answer is, we need to make it happen as soon as possible. It's shorter than it was, we're getting very close. Um, Steven said, you know, th there could be an invention tomorrow that even accelerates the process. But um, here is the critical thing. We have enough information right now that we could start breaking ground tomorrow and build a commercial fusion plant. We're still not at the point where we think that's smart. We're getting close. We're designing a bunch of things and there are private sector initiatives that are getting that direction. But the, the point is we, we, we could build, if you think of the history of automobiles, we could build a Model T Ford right now. We're not quite ready to build a Tesla. So, if you, what, Jane's idea of the practice moon is that is best understood in terms of what are the challenges remaining between where we are now and commercial fusion. So you've heard some of them, but let me just give you a list. So one list is engineering scale up, right? 
So a lot of the stuff that we're doing at Eacher isn't new. It's just bigger. And, and no matter how big you build the machine, the size of the particles you're controlling aren't any aren't any bigger. You still the neutrons and the and the protons and so forth stay the same size. So the the precision of the magnetic field, whether it is at jet scale or part, spark scale or ether scale, the precision has to be the same. It has to be like the weave of your jacket or Egyptian cotton or whatever you want to really hold the particles in. So um, even when you're building bigger. Even if it's the same device, you need new engineering techniques. And ITER, both with, with its successes and sometimes our setbacks, we're showing how to do that. And I, I talk to people in private sector constantly who are learning from ITER and reshaping this or that. And they're like, oh, ITER built it that way. We've learned from that. We want to do it a better way. So that's that's part of the the, the remaining, the, the first of the remaining challenges. Another one is tritium breeding. You've heard us talk about breeding tritium from lithium. We have to figure out how to do that efficiently. eter has got a couple of ideas. Uh, MIT's working on, a, on another sort of model. Um, everybody needs to get to that if they're using deuterium tritium. Then materials. So in materials, we've got all sorts of, of uh, challenges. Many of them are, are getting constantly overcome. But that neutron that comes out, you that... 14 mega electron volt neutron that I said would reach the moon in eight or nine seconds. That is both great in terms of energy and also destructive when you have a whole bunch of those. So you've got to make better and better materials. So those are just examples of some of the things we're trying to overcome. With all that said, um, eter has got a timeline where we will be at full fusion power in around 2035. Now, we've had some setbacks recently, so because of those setbacks, we're looking at how do we do some other things in parallel. If you go to our website now, you read about something called First Plasma, which is supposed to happen in 2025. We know we're not going to make that date, but we might just skip First Plasma. Why? Because that's just turning on the basic device to make sure it works and then turning it off again. There's not a big scientific value, and we have other components already being made that we thought were going to come later. So we might actually assemble those a little earlier and get to plasma 1.5 or 2.0. So because of that complexity, when you ask me how long does it take to build the machine, I have to say I don't know. But it's not because it's a stupid question, and it's not because um, we're trying to go any slower. We are constantly evaluating how to speed up to support as many projects globally to get fusion ultimately to the grid as soon as possible. That's the best answer I can give you. Well, thank, thank you once again for all of those answers. Um, we also have a few more questions um, that I've just noted down. Um, so one, one that I really liked um, and found quite cool was, um, so once nuclear fusion is mastered, could it be used um, in a moon base to power, um, plans to power it? Um, from Enkash um, Nitali Garak um, from Dubai College. Um, as well, just to add a few more on, um, where and or how could we use catalysts during fusion? from um, Kim Yak, um, a Delhi private school. If anyone would like to contribute to those or other questions you see and are interested in. And I think it's time to put um, the uh, Sir Stephen on the hotspot here for a few of the answers. Um, or, or then again, there's always the better, uh, the better half from Princeton, Arturo. No, no, I like I. I'd like to hear Steve uh, answer to the question about the moon. Like, That's like, exactly can we put, right. Can we put fusion energy? Uh, what is it? Future energy plants? Uh, fusion energy plants on the moon, and how would that work? <laughs> I'm, I'm actually pretty curious, Steve. What are your thoughts on that? Putting a fusion energy plant on the moon. There's been um. The discussion of using it, obviously, um, 
right from the start of, of trying to do fusion uh, because you know the weight of the fuel is so low that we would like to use fusion for interstellar travel um and maybe interplanetary travel um i think putting it on the moon yes maybe but until we have we have to supply energy to somebody on the moon i think at this point you know it's uh let's just get it working um at, at this point but there is a there's a company out of princeton called princeton satellite systems that's looking at uh fusion uh, rocket systems um obviously you know the constraints of putting something on a rocket are much greater than doing it even in the lab um so i i think that this is down the road but if you wanted to go to another star um then it's difficult to imagine doing it with a chemical rocket because you have to carry so much fuel with it you it just you know is inconceivable but with fusion yeah you could conceive of doing it. yeah I, actually one thing i would add is so so yeah absolutely the the interstellar inner space travel using fusion rockets hall thruster that's really something uh that that is in the horizon uh but one one thing is sort of in the lines of uh what uh Steve was saying earlier about this company TAE that has this aneutronic uh, fusion. There's another fusion reaction using helium three, which is really rare. You can't really find it on Earth, but there are you know there there are deposits of it on the Moon. So I can imagine maybe having uh, some sort of intermediate step in which you're having DT fusion plants on the Moon to help drill for helium-3 and then using that for advanced fusion fuels or something like now you start getting my science my sci-fi brain going <laughs> you you imagine them going from one place to the other using hull thruster rockets and then you get into star trek territory yeah which which by the way i want to celebrate but i also want to just throw in the let's clean up our problem here with fusion first 100 percent but I, I think know. it's really easy. Let's to not talk about that. getting more mining, more mining done unnecessarily. <laughs> right. Um, we, I, I have, we have a couple of uh, basic tenets at ECG, and one is first, do no harm. So that means no harm to people if you can, you know, recognize the practices, recognize who's involved, and um, and give uh, consent and autonomy to all involved. Uh, and that would be from citing to using to access. Um, and also, um, you know, we are we are the external catalyst. So we're the ones pushing hard and reminding all of those who are um, whose gray whose gray matter is focused on the on the physics, not to get bog, bogged down in the things that go wrong, because there's never been a great achievement that wasn't made up of a lot of we could call them failures or problems it's not about the failures or problems it's about the fact that you kept going and you use that learning to get to get to the next step and to solve the problem um because as i think you've heard on this panel the potential for fusion to desalinate water to produce uh, direct heat for all the different industrial uses of, of heavy energy that we don't think about daily, for the manufacturing of the materials that we will need for fusion power plants and wind turbines and solar panels. Um, in other words, this is a, a massive space, which will also offer those listening and many, many, I would say tens of thousands of others, economic, um, I think there was a term of art that you used, Kayla, that I wanted to write down and I didn't, but it would, it'll give um, jobs that have, you can have pride of ownership in your jobs, regardless of where you are on the complexity scale, because anyone working in clean energy is working on the solution to the biggest problem we all face. So I, I can't encourage this audience more um, and as my children would, my, I have daughters, that's why I work on fusion. Um, and as they would be the first to say, um, and I think it was, it was said by many others, we talk about fusion to everyone and, and all the time, 
which makes my my daughters cringe whenever we go in public because there's always somebody that I don't know that I'm going to talk to about fusion. And I will tell you, it's always the people who are under 30 that inspire me the most. So thank you, um, Jonah, and thank you all of the panelists. And most of all, thank you participants for, for joining us. Um, this is incredibly inspiring. Are there other questions you want to end with, Jonah? Um, can um, I say something? Uh, Sorry. Um, so in the same line of thinking that Jane was saying about not causing any harm, I did see a question, I think, from Femi Fatola, and it's what are the plans to ensure the impacts of mining minerals needed to build fusion energy that do not result into another crisis, considering the highly impacts, high impacts of mining to the present global warming and how the process will be just to the African countries. And I know at COP27, one of the big things that they were talking about were loss and damages on how basically we've been mining all of these countries and causing harm to countries that do not emit as much carbon as the rest of the world, developed world. So if there's anyone that wants to answer that question. And this might be a, a, a question answered by some of the invisible panelists here um, who are, are uh, legal minds working within the COP system. Um, but I think uh, as the questioner may not have heard, one of the things we brought up is for instance, in lithium mining specifically, um, there are already advances being promoted to look at, at non-standard uh, mining practices at, at extracting lithium from seawater, for example, or geothermal brine as we have in the Salton Sea in California. But uh, you're absolutely right, questioner. I, I, I've been seeing it, and this has been something that's going more and more in my mind uh, recently, which is this idea that it would really be terrible if we developed all of the technology for fusion and we got to the point where we've solved all of these problems that Laban laid out, right? By bringing on these folks and bring, and then we're ready to deploy and then nobody will take, them, right? Because we haven't, we haven't convinced the public that we're a force for good. Or even worse, if we if we do deploy it and we can build it, and then we end up causing damage, uh, uh, you know, more damage than good uh, to especially communities that have been historically more uh, impacted by, by development of energy. So I think we, now that we're in this discussions of commercialization, we really are pushing for in parallel having the conversation of, how do we get the community on board? How do we get the general public? Um, and we address the concerns, the, 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 the genuine concerns that the general public have so that we can reach there with them, right? I think that's critical. Music to my ears. I would also um, be happy to add to what Arturo said and, and, and respond to the question that Kayla highlighted. Um, I'm going to answer it in a provocative manner first. Um, if you look at solar panels, for example, which we think of as being a very clean source of energy, and they are, um, or wind turbines, yeah, both of those uh, pan both of those sources of clean energy um, need massive improvement. Why do I say that? They use they do use some uh, minerals that involve considerable mining. And when you trace all the supply chain back, um, you find that um, some of that some of that is done in a, well, almost all of that mining is still done with fossil fuels. If you I talked to somebody in the UK recently who's a big distributor of of solar panels in in uh, in the UK and asked, where do you get them? And the answer was, well, to be honest, most of our panels are sourced from China. And I said, so what is the uh, what is the source of electricity that is used in the factories that make these panels? And they said, well, mostly coal. So I said, you're telling me that we've got minerals in solar panels mined using fossil fuels, and then you're using coal, you're burning coal, to manufacture the solar panels, and they're get, then you're going to send them somewhere, and some owner, some industrial or personal private owner will, will use them to make 
energy, and we're going to call that clean, right? So it's not as bad as I made it. I said, have you done the calculation? How long do you need to, to use the solar panels before you compensate for the fossil fuels you used in mining and in manufacturing? And the answer is not so bad. It's a couple of years and you, you can get to that provided you're using all the solar panels. So there, it is a net positive. But the critical thing is to praise the person who raised this question about mining, because it's the right question to challenge every energy source you see. Look at the entire chain. What populations are affected? And I will say that I have never worked. I, if you look at my resume, which, um, you know, it's, it, it's just a mess. I mean, I, I took a very circuitous pathway to get to fusion. But I've worked in a lot of different energy environments, and I have never seen a population of engineers and designers and scientists so focused on ensuring what Jane called do no harm. So that means building a workforce that is diverse. It means creating an energy source that is not for the US or the UK, but for all humankind. It means trying to create that in a way that can actually reach the planet. So I'll close with a thought here. If we, because we haven't covered economics and some of the questions addressed, you know, what will be the cost, et cetera. Um, if you think about, if you go back in your history classes and you look at the last 120 or more years, that we've been using fossil fuels, go through every armed conflict you can find, go through every history lesson in which we had trade wars or we made we, we fought and ask the question, what role was energy playing? Because for the last 100 or 150 years, we have been trying, many of our armed conflicts have been to position ourselves close to fossil fuels. Right now in Europe, people are worried about the cost of energy for the winter largely influenced by the, the, the conflict going on with, with Russia and Ukraine. Yeah, so think about how much did those armed conflicts cost? Because when somebody says, what is the cost per kilowatt hour of this or this or this source of electricity, they rarely take into account all of that. They don't account for the waste of fossil fuels that are going into the atmosphere because we don't put precise costs on climate change. But if you factor all of that in and you say now, We've got an energy source that could be equally available to all countries. And the, and the quote, mining of deuterium from seawater is not invasive, doesn't hurt any country, can be done relatively cheaply. Yeah. Lithium also can be done fairly cheaply unless we, as long as we can figure out how to get it from seawater. The, the amount we're using now for lithium batteries and so forth has some negative, but not terrifically negative effects. But think about a world in which the geopolitics, meaning how we relate as country to country, would be to give every country an energy source for which they would have nearly unlimited fuel. And how much would that help us to stop fighting, at least over energy? We're not gonna be perfect human beings, but what could be the positive effect on that? Not just on energy, but on conflict and on how we relate to each other as humans. Thank you for that, Laban. I'm incredible answer just um so first of all thank you um especially to everybody from um the uae just calling you out you are the next hosts of in the cop um and it would be terrific to see um people there um representing um also just one final question for the panelists um from rados law um from sweden effectively, what are the next steps? And I think that matter. I think the question is, whom, to whom are you asking the question? I, I have a whole list of the next steps because ECG's entire focus is on now that we've proven a device works, do we have the customers? Do we have the population? Do we have the regulation? Do we have the messy stuff start, sorted out, the people stuff? Um, but long before uh, we're able to prove our import there, uh, Steve Cowley, Arturo, uh, Kayla, and uh, Pablo, if he was still on the line with us, not to mention Laban, will be hard at work. Uh, Steve, do you want to take that? Uh, 
I think these next five years are going to be a fantastic experience because we're getting very close to fusion burn in many, many concepts. And as we do that, the money uh, from private industry is going to swell. Money from governments is going to swell. Um, let's get the science done as quickly as possible. I love science, but we're not in this for science. We're in this to make a, a power source and it, the job's not done. Um, and we just have to push through to the end. The, the, the end game is on, but it's up to us to push through. Thank you very much, everybody. I've enjoyed this very much and, and inspired. It simply remains for me to thank everyone who has contributed to this online workshop for youth and experts, including all our speakers, our generous collaborators, and co-hosts, ECG and ETER, and also my physics don, who stayed online with us for the whole event and originally inspired me in this field. Fusion power is obviously going to be the future of energy. So especially when we take a youth perspective, it becomes clear why we want this. We have to think not only about the incredibly exciting next five years, but also what will happen after that. Fusion power is an investment in our future and the future of the entire human race. There are also many opportunities, especially for youth, and ways for people to get involved. One of those is through our studies, discovering more in this field and advancing spin-off technologies. Another is advocacy. We can call for changes to laws and policies, adapting our social, economic, and political systems themselves to promote renewable energy, including fusion power. Finally, youth can really help in raising awareness. Fusion power is now gaining attention, but by spreading the word and organizing events, as well as helping schools introduce it into the curriculums globally, we can really help it make a difference. Fusion power still has some skeptics because of its association with old nuclear power, despite them being very different technologies, as we've covered today. Energy for the common good, which I serve as a youth advisor, is working to advance the acceptance of fusion energy as an integral part of the clean energy economy. Basically, building replacement markets for fossil fuels in response to advancing climate change timelines. ECG has launched a targeted Hearts and Minds campaign to develop a social and economic engagement strategy that will lay the proper groundwork for the future of fusion. Many young people are joining the effort worldwide. Finally, for the fascinated young mathematicians and scientists among us, there is also a ton of research that still needs to be done for fusion to function. This is a brilliant opportunity as people with the knowledge and skills to understand the physics and ideas that fusion are based, is based on, as well as people with the engineering and manufacturing skills to assemble the pieces. Essentially, it's an inspiring time to be alive. And I'd like to thank everyone who is helping youth like us find our way in this emerging field towards a more sustainable future, the future we want. Thank you.